morning, everybody. Um, I'm Stephanie Ross. I'm the director of the School of Labor Studies at McMaster University, which is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Um, I'm sure we are all joining uh, from different uh, traditional Indigenous territories, uh, but of course when we gather we want to keep in mind uh, our relations and to engage uh, with each other, with those good relations in mind. Um, welcome to the last installment of our 2021-22 speaker series featuring Do Dr. Rob Gillizo, who is here with me this morning. Um, this is the last of our planned events for this year, but um, we have a speaker series every year. So if you're interested in finding out about what we're doing in future uh, years next year, please follow our Facebook page, which is at facebook.com slash MacLabor, or you can also follow us on Twitter at MacLabor. Um, all of the announcements of our events and other things that we're doing are uh, on those two social media channels. Um, so hope that you'll we'll see you again in the future at other events. Um, so um, to talk a little bit about today's session, uh, which, um, you know, I think comes at a time of uh, you know, when the, the role of the police has come under significant scrutiny, I mean, few could have missed that, particularly in the last decade, and especially with respect to their role in managing marginalized peoples and expressions of dissent. Um, for labor movements, police have long been a vexing issue. Uh, should they be treated as workers with the same rights to collective bargaining and workplace representation, as indeed the Supreme Court of Canada decisions make, you know, endorse and, and make clear they should. Um, but from a political perspective in the labor, in the labor movement world, uh, should police be seen as members of the House of Labor, welcomed in labor federations, should they want to join, or even unions of other public sector workers? Those are very live debates within uh, labor movements today. Or does the coercive role of the police in managing dissent, particularly that of other workers and those who seek racial and social equality, mean that police should be treated as apart from the labor movement? Um, this discussion takes place today within a, the larger context of a labor movement that is both struggling to expand its ranks, um, which may, you know, shape uh, certain unions or organizations' orientations to this question, but also striving to connect with racialized communities and issues of racial justice and indeed to, to lead or support um, those who are struggling on those issues. So, with that in mind, we have today, I would say, a unique contribution to this discussion, uh, asking the question, do collective bargaining rights for law enforcement result in more civilian deaths at the hands of the police, particularly for people of color? And so Dr. Rob Gillizo is going to present research today that, I guess, spoiler alert, shows that the introduction of duty to bargain requirements for police unions has led to a significant increase in non-white civilian deaths at the hands of police in the United States during the late 20th century. And um, Dr. Gillizo is going to present the basis of that uh, argument, and we're going to have a chance to explore what that means uh, more broadly in terms of uh, policy responses and political responses from the labor movement. Um, so let me say a few words about our speaker um, and then turn it over to him to present his research. Dr. Rob Gillizo is an assistant professor in the Department of Economics uh, at the University of Victoria, cross-listed with the School of Public Administration, and he is a fellow of the Broadbent Institute as well. Uh, from 2011 to 2015, he served as the chief economist in the office of the leader of the official opposition in Ottawa. Um, he received his PhD from the Department of Economics at the University of Michigan in 2015. From 2017 to 2019, he served as the senior aide to the Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier of British Columbia. Uh, Dr. Gillizo's research focuses on topics in economic history, labor economics, and public policy, applying causal methodology from labor economics to answer questions in modern American and Canadian economic history. His current research projects, obviously one of which he's talking to us about today, are primarily divided into two broad areas, African-American protest and police killings of civilians, and the economic history of the Indigenous peoples of North America. So, uh, 
before I turn it over to Dr. Gillizo, we're going to ask him to speak for, for 45 to 50 minutes. He's going to have some slides to share with us. And then we'll have about 40 to 45 minutes for a question and answer. Um, and what I would say is you can put your question in the Q&A uh, box, but indicate if you wish to ask it yourself to him directly and I can we can make you visible so you can appear on the screen and ask him your question and have a have a dialogue with him otherwise if you prefer I can ask your question uh, on your behalf uh, to, to Rob so without further ado I'll turn it over to Dr. Gilzo thank you so much Stephanie it's a it's a real pleasure to be here today and and honestly I this is a type of paper where you know I, I'm an economist by trade I present mainly to economists this is exactly the type of paper uh, that, that I want to speak with people uh, who are doing labor studies, who are in the labor movement about. Uh, I am a trade unionist. I have been a trade unionist uh, pretty much my entire working life. Uh, that does not describe a lot of economists. Uh, and so that is, right, this type of perspective is one that I, I often don't get on this work. So let me toss up the slides and jump straight into things. Okay, so just to confirm that's coming through okay? Everybody can, uh, can see the slides and hear me okay? Can I get a thumbs up or any type of indicator? Yep, you're good, you're good. Lovely, thanks Stephanie. Uh, so first, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to join you from Victoria, British Columbia, uh, the homelands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples. Uh, and this is, this is joint work. Uh, and it's joint work with two of my frequent co-authors, but actually from different sides of my research agenda, uh, Dr. Jamie Cunningham, who is at Cornell University, who I have worked on policing and protest with for about a decade, and Dr. Don Fair from the University of Victoria, who I traditionally work on Indigenous economic history topics with, uh, but ended up joining us on this project, uh, and, and it's been a real delight. And we're hopeful that this paper is going to be in print relatively soon, fingers crossed. Uh, so, you know, you could say, Rob, why as an economist is, is this an area that you're working in? Why, why is it something that you maybe not care about, but why, why do you feel like economists can make a contribution that is valuable? Well, I mean, economists are good at causal identification, right? We often have all sorts of interesting views about the world, uh, but we do statistics well. Uh, uh, economic historians in particular are good at embedding uh, that causal identification within institutions in a meaningful way. You can always view us as kind of hybrid economists and other people who may be better fit into the social scientists and some of our peers. And so that type of dual treatment felt appropriate to this question. In econ audiences, I often need to justify, yeah, why, why are you talking about civilian deaths? Why are you talking about policing? Is that economics? Uh, and, you know, economists are supposed to care about the welfare of the public. Uh, and if you were being killed, right, that obviously has a dramatic impact on your welfare. Uh, the welfare of your friends and the welfare of your family, right? So I, I view this as a fairly uh, obvious topic that we should be discussing. Where does this fall within my, my broader agenda? You know, so Jamie and I started working about 10 years ago, uh, setting the 1960s uprisings from a causal perspective. Uh, since we started doing that work, there's been tremendous work by Elizabeth Hinton at Yale that's helped reframe those uprisings as being explicit protests about police violence that were to some degree, right, mirrored through communications and, and racism uh, and how they were treated. Uh, so my earliest work in this space looked at the impact of those uprisings in the 1960s on the use of lethal force. Uh, and since then, Jamie and I have been going through systematically and trying to uncover what changes in institutions in the United States in the 1960s and 1970s contributed to America ending up in this sort of bad equilibrium where there are enormously high levels of civilian deaths. Uh, and when we hear about this in popular culture, right, what is one of the first things that comes up in almost every discussion? Uh, it's accountability for law enforcement and how that might link into uh, collective bargaining and the labor movement. So I, again, as I noted, the motivation here is, is relatively easy now. Uh, I, I should say that there has been in the academy broadly, but especially in, in disciplines that were maybe a little bit less, a little bit more hesitant to jump into considering uh, police violence. Uh, the murder of George Floyd has been a complete changer in terms of perceptions in the academy. Um, but in my first presentation uh, at, a, at a conference uh, as a faculty member, so this was five or six years ago, I was speaking on the paper I mentioned about, about the 1960s uprisings and the use of lethal force, and, you know, talk went over well, uh, you know, junior scholars seemed to like it a lot, and a very senior scholar pulled me aside at the end and said, you know, this is, this is terrible work, you should be embarrassed, this has nothing to do with economics, uh, 
you know, is, is that the type of message uh, that folks in this space are getting today? No. And rather, right, we're seeing a flood of scholars from relatively high profile institutions into this research space because there's a recognition that it matters. Uh, one of the biggest shifts uh, in this research agenda uh, and re research space is that I would say we spent a good 10 years, maybe 15 years, kind of asking, is discrimination happening? Uh, and I think a lot of folks in this room would probably step back and say, is that really the most salient question? Like, it, it seems relatively transparent that it is happening. And I think it's relatively clear from works like uh, Edward es Esposito and Lee uh, and a series of other papers by Ross, Corell, Cesaria. We, we know that there is dramatic discrimination in law enforcement. Sure, there are going to be individual departments and many individual officers who are good actors. But we know systemically that there is now a mass of evidence right, showing that this is occurring. Uh, and that evidence is primarily from the United States, not because we don't know that it doesn't happen or we don't know the situation can, we just we have no data. Uh, and we can't get access to the data generally north of the border to test this in a causal fashion, which is a frustration. So, I mean, we, we know this is happening. What have we linked these disparities to? Uh, there's a linkage to protest movements. Uh, in particular, in the 1960s, we saw unfortunately, uh, that protest movements against police violence led to the use of more violence against uh, people from those protesting communities, uh, which is pretty much the most perverse outcome you could imagine, but but so is uh, so is politics in some situations when politicians see a potential win. Uh, we know that there are some linkages structurally to economic inequality, to political empowerment, and we know that departmental practice matters across the board. So the race of the responding officer, uh, kind of the reaction of your peer to a situation, uh, the use of technology, these things can all matter a great deal. And a lot of this work uh, is done kind of in the present day. And I'm gonna go and take a historical look. Uh, and so I would say that, you know, where, where are things shifting, right? It's this focus uh, to look at accountability and protections for officers. Uh, and right, thinking about collective bargaining in that, in that context is a pretty natural jump. So in, in public discussions, you know, I, police unions come up in probably the majority uh, of the recent high profile cases, I would say over the last decade that we've seen related to the use of lethal force against non-white Americans. So in, in the killing of Tamir Rice, right, so a 12 year old boy uh, who was shot dead at a playground, you know, the police union obviously provided all of the regular upfront protections that you would expect. Uh, you know, they pushed a media narrative, the American, the, the American judicial system, right, certainly has this political communications dimension that isn't quite as present uh, in Canada. Uh, but the, the Patrolman's Association was out there doing the media cycle, saying, you know, this, this kid was threatening, uh, the, to quote the, the president of the union, you know, he's menacing, he's five feet seven, 191 pounds, he wasn't that little kid you're seeing in the pictures, right? So actively out there making the case, providing full financial support for the officer, uh, and Eventually, what happened to the officer uh, who killed Tamir Rice, uh, he wasn't penalized for, for that shooting uh, and that killing. Rather, right, it turned out that he had actually lied on his job application. Uh, and so he was terminated by the employer. And six years after that happened, right, the union is still in court uh, fighting to get him his job back. In the case of Amber Geiger, right, one of the uh, historically rare cases where the officers involved in, in the killing of the civilian were, were prosecuted successfully, uh, the union, the, the role of the union was remarkable and actually was tested in front of the courts. Uh, so the, the union rep and actually the union president, in me, after uh, this was a, an incident where Officer Geiger went into the wrong apartment while drunk uh, and killed the resident of that apartment, uh, the, the union rep and the president showed up immediately on the scene, huddled the officers, uh, attempted to hold back uh, Officer Geiger from engaging in any type of uh, provision of a statement and made sure that the local officers on the scene right, had a consistent story, right? So that type of guidance uh, is a core role that police unions play on the scene in a way that you know, might have some commonalities with the role that a shop steward might play elsewhere, but also intersects with and to some degree creates a parallel justice system for these officers. Now, if you wanna think a little bit more recently uh, to the murder of George Floyd, right? This was, I, I would say that in thinking about the broader implications of this work, Right, and, and, and how the House of Labor is going to approach this topic, right? We saw a dramatic break. Uh, and so traditionally in, in the events of potentially unjustified killings of civilians, in particular uh, African-American civilians, right? Labor, labor is kind of supportive of the BLM cause, but hesitant uh, to engage in any type of political conflict 
uh, with police unions. You know, there have been uh, outliers within that. And, and my, my actual kind of original home union is the American Federation of Teachers, uh, which is one of the more uh, BLM aligned uh, unions. But in, with the murder of George Floyd, we saw the AFL-CIO come together and call for the ouster uh, of the head of the Minneapolis Police Union uh, because of inflammatory statements that he was making about George Floyd. Uh, this was a sharp break. Uh, and we saw not just the labor movement turn uh, on the police union in this case, but right, we actively saw the public uh, turn on the police union. And so that was a market shift in public opinion and one that seems to have slowed down, uh, but it's gonna be worth watching over the medium run. So, you know, why, what, what channel do we think this might play into the use of lethal force? Really, it's this accountability channel around prosecution of officers, right? If you, uh, if we want to kind of step back and uh, economists think about margins. So wh where might uh, potential prosecution play a role in the use of lethal force? You're a, say, let's imagine that you're a well-intentioned officer uh, and you're, you're in that dark alley uh, and you feel like your, your life might be a threat, but you don't really know. Right, you, the person across the way who is threatening you may have a weapon, may not have a weapon. Uh, if you use lethal force against that person and they are armed, right, maybe that's the right decision. Maybe it's not, but you certainly you're unlikely to face uh, consequences. If they're unarmed, right, there is a chance that you lose your job, that you are prosecuted. Uh, and if we, right, if we shift the propensity uh, with which prosecution occurs, successful prosecution, right, that's going to shift the decision at the margin. Uh, to use force in that situation. So we could think that any changes, uh, any institutions that shift that margin could matter. Uh, and so my head initially turns to police unions and collective bargaining agreements. Another channel that I actually have, I have new work on, uh, law enforcement officer bills of rights, take a lot of these provisions related to accountability. So delays in giving a statement, uh, uh, giving uh, officers access to evidence that is otherwise being submitted, deleting disciplinary records, a, a whole gamut of things that basically makes it very difficult to prosecute an officer and essentially kind of deletes their record on a go forward basis. Uh, those could matter. Uh, although it turns out that they, they don't matter all that much. And, and the story I'm going to tell you is that they come in so late that most of what the, those laws do is already done by police unions. Or it could be this culture, right? This a kind of perverted sense of solidarity amongst officers uh, that makes it just really difficult to, to prosecute. Uh, police unions, right? They can matter up front in the collective agreement in terms of shifting that prosecution margin. But they can also matter, right, in that they provide active support, they can provide uh, logistical delays or logistical benefits in the criminal justice system, and in a politicized legal system, right, having communications professionals associated with the union working on behalf of the officer, uh, it's something that most, right, defendants, most people who, who engage in a potentially unjustified a killing of a civilian uh, wouldn't necessarily have. So you, you might think, okay, so yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Why don't we really have any work in the space? Uh, one, uh, endogeneity, that's an economist word, meaning we, we don't really know which way causation is going to run, right? It might be the case that in, in these very difficult environments, right, where we have relatively high levels of, of civilian deaths, police unions are more likely to appear because, you know, maybe there's a health and safety component and the police union is officers are worried about their safety, so they're forming the union. Flipping it, right, it might be the case that uh, the community gets organized, uh, starts calling for civilian oversight, uh, and this is actually what happens in the history, uh, and then the union uh, jumps in as a way to block uh, that civilian oversight or some other institutional reform. We can imagine that over time there's going to be spillover, and that's going to be an effect I'm going to talk about, and that right, those initial police unions that come in are likely going to have big treatment effects. But 30 or 40 years down the line, if the sector, if the sector is 80% organized, right, odds are that those benefits have spilled over uh, to non-union departments. Uh, and then last, this is state level uh, bargaining. Uh, so all of these data, right, are split out between every state capital in as far as they exist. So you can't actually get central access uh, to the election data uh, or even to, to certs in, until at least after 1987. Uh, so right, there are a whole bunch of challenges, and we're going to get around those challenges by focusing in on the legal regime related to collective bargaining, rather than looking at union elections themselves. And as far as there is a literature, uh, there's a team of uh, legal scholars uh, at the University of Chicago who looked at a narrow expansion of collective bargaining rights to a subset of sheriff's deputies uh, in Florida in the 2000s. 
And they actually end up finding, they don't look at lethal force, they look at the use of force, but their results are gonna be consistent with what we find today. And then there's a second paper uh, by Felipe Goncalves at UCLA, who looks at union formation, but only in a more recent era and doesn't separate out any of the results by race. And he's not finding anything. And I'm gonna tell you that that's not inconsistent with our story, although at first glance, it might be viewed as a tension. So I'll come back to that a little bit later in the talk. <clears throat> so the game plan uh, is, right, we're gonna look at the rollout of collective bargaining rights for law enforcement in the United States. What is helpful for getting kind of causal identification here uh, is that police gain the right to collectively bargain state by state in the United States. And it basically is bundled uh, with other state public employees, typically firefighters, but all, all, basically always the core civil service uh, when they get those rights. And so we can look at when states turn that on uh, versus states that turn it on later versus states that never turn on collective bargaining rights for those employees to get a sense as to the actual impact. I'm gonna focus in on uh, civilians killed by law enforcement, but we're also gonna look at a number of other outcomes, right? Because you could imagine that, right? Unions might impact productivity. Uh, they might impl impact worker safety. So we're gonna consider that full range of outcomes. And onto, the results are gonna be a little bit surprising across the board. Uh, so, so what do we find? So the top line result is that we see that collective bargaining rights leads to this dramatic increase in killings of non-white civilians. It's a 70% over baseline effect. Uh, that is a, in the world of treatment effects, that is very large. Uh, it's large enough that it explains 10% of all non-white Americans killed uh, kind of over our sample period. Uh, we find no upfront change in the killings of white civilians, uh, but why do we find this, this racial gap? I mean, even if we expected, even if we expected there to be more non-white civilians being killed than white civilians, right? And that simple story I told you around that kind of, you know, the riskiness of the marginal decision to shoot, you would expect more white people to be killed as well. And the reason we don't find that in the data, and this is jumping to the last point here, uh, is that we actually see associated with collective bargaining a large shift in police engagement with the public. And in particular, as police unions roll in, we see a shift towards quota-based policing in which right, you're getting compensated if you make X many arrests, you card X many people, uh, and it is not viewed as socially acceptable to do that in the 1960s and 1970s in white communities. So officers actually shift their policing activities to black communities. Uh, and as such, right, we just see a, a dramatic shift in engagement. And if you're engaging, you're more likely to, to kill people, uh, unfortunately. And so if we correct for that differential level of engagement, we actually see deaths of non-white and white civilians increase. So everyone is actually becoming a little bit less safe, conditional on their being kind of in, in a region with police officers present. Uh, we're going to find no impact on crime, uh, no impact on officers killed. We find suggestive evidence of declines in police employment, and that's consistent with, right, with the union pushing wages up. Uh, and then last, you could say, well, we're, you know, is this just something else going on that's tied to collective bargaining? You know, is this just a signal of values or some other piece of legislation? <clears throat> we know when unions are present as of 1987. So what we're able to do is we can kind of go and say, let's look at this treatment effect, but only look at this treatment effect uh, considering places that have unions as of 1987 or earliest data versus those that don't. And the entire treatment effect is proven by places that have unions. Uh, so we feel quite comfortable uh, in that being the causal channel. <clears throat> so yeah, I'll probably run over, especially some of the, some of the empirical uh, design pieces a little bit quicker, but I do want to give the history uh, full time here because I think it's important. I think it's important for, for thinking through uh, where police unions fall in the House of Labor. Then I'll quickly talk about the research design and get into the results. <clears throat> so I mean, one thing that's been really interesting in, in doing this work is there aren't actually a lot of people, uh, including labor historians, who, who, who know much about the history of police unions. <laughs> so police unions actually get going in, in the 1800s. Uh, you know, they're not the earliest public sector movers, right? Those are, those are uh, postal workers. Uh, but we start getting charters in the late 19th century, right? Which is relatively early movement. Uh, they're uh, in the House of Labor traditionally, they're within the AFL, right? So it's not the Knights of Labor or anyone getting in. It's kind of conservative uh, trade unionism, but they're, but they're solidly in the movement. Uh, and those early drives have a lot of success, right? Going into World War I, there are 40 uh, AFL charter unions, most of the big cities in the uh, Mid-Atlantic and Midwest and parts of the Northeast. <coughs> and what are those unions doing? They're regular unions. 
right? Uh, if I look at a police collective agreement now, it looks very different than other collective agreements. But these historical unions, right, officers are working 70 to 90 hours a week. They have ridiculous out, you know, they have ridiculous hours. They're made to pay for their own uniforms. They have to sleep in the station, which sometimes is not heated, often doesn't have appropriate sanitation. Uh, right, so the, these unions are grounded in good old fashioned health and safety, compensation, you know, fair and reasonable working conditions. <clears throat> but these aren't the unions that I'm studying. Uh, and why is that? Well, right, the post-war crackdown after World War I doesn't just hit private sector workers, it hits public sector workers. <clears throat> and so the proximate cause, right, I, I, I think that this would have happened regardless of the Boston police strike, <clears throat> but in 1919 in Boston, we see a, a huge job action. And it's a job action grounded in, in much of what I just described. Uh, you know, and, and it, 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 it doesn't go well in terms of public perception. <clears throat> there is genuine unrest. Uh, and politicians, right, see, see the backlash from the public and they see this as an opportunity to hit back at the labor movement because it, right, police are part of the core labor movement at this point <clears throat> and to get a political win. Uh, and so the, you know, the governor of the state comes out and says, there's no right to strike against the public safety by anybody anywhere. Uh, President Woodrow Wilson gets involved and, and calls the strike a crime against civilization. Uh, and so the backlash is severe. The backlash is severe enough that this is given as part of the reason that public sector workers are excluded uh, from right, the early uh, legalization of collective bargaining rights in the, in the United States uh, under Roosevelt. <coughs> and so the House of Labor is, is just wiped from the sector. Uh, what survives? What survives are these organizations that are going to become the police unions that by and large, make up the majority of the movement today. <clears throat> and so these are the fraternal orders and the benevolent associations. And right, they fill many of those same social insurance roles that early unions do, but they have a distinct culture. <clears throat> so these unions are gone coming out of World War I. Uh, we see, you know, there were a number of attempts to get back into the sector, even before uh, workers gain access to bargaining rights. We see Ask Me, uh, the Teamsters, a couple of different unions try to break in. Uh, they, they have no luck. Uh, they're, they're pretty easily repulsed in their, in their organizing drives. <coughs> Where do we start to see things change? Well, uh, in 1959, uh, we do see a successful drive in New York City. Uh, and then it's going to spread out from New York City after that first win to a number of other locations, and I'll come back to why in a second. Uh, th this is facilitated legally, right, by Kennedy's executive order 10988 uh, in 1962, which guarantees bargaining rights for federal employees, which we've already got a couple of states that have moved at that point on public sector bargaining rights, but states move en masse after the feds move. <coughs> now, what do we think drove uh, these organizing drives? <coughs> We don't, quantitatively, we don't know for sure. But the qualitative history suggests that one of the biggest factors uh, was the ACLU launching a campaign for civilian oversight. Uh, that seems to have uh, been present in a lot of the literature related to the organizing drives. And it's that mixed with right, this, this sense that there is a, that police are under threat, that there was a war on police. I mean, this familiar narrative, <coughs> but that's very much the narrative coming out of the uprisings of the 1960s. And there's a strong desire from the public right, to have police clamp down on those uprisings. Uh, and so they're in a position of strength to, to secure these wins. And these organizing drives are wildly successful, right, to the point that police make up or about 80% of, of workers with access to bargaining rights where police officers are, are in a union. It's right? so one of the most heavily organized sectors in the U.S. and with no real attrition, right? So if they were, if they were truly in the House of Labor, gosh, would they be one of the absolute power players with almost no bargaining union erosion over, over 50 years. So in practice, right, I think we, we all know what unions do here. So this is an easier piece. A lot of other folks don't, especially economists, unfortunately. Uh, like what, what is unique in the practice of these unions is that, well, for Canadian police officers, there is a much firmer division between labor relations and judicial uh, application of the judicial system to an officer. Those lines are fully blurred in the American context. <coughs> so your shop steward, or your president for the local, right, isn't he, he or she is providing, right, this basic employment protection, but it's also influencing the course of justice. And so just imagine intersecting uh, kind of your, your regular contractual provisions with the justice system, and you end up with this really fascinating uh, and frankly parallel justice system. 
And so that is what is unique about these unions in practice relative to others. <clears throat> what, what lets them play that unique role? Uh, Stephen Russian, who is a law professor and probably the expert on the provisions in these agreements at Loyola, he's broken down a series of measures uh, that limit accountability for officers. I'm gonna disagree with the one at the end, <coughs> but I think in general, this is a reasonable list. So it's common practice in these collective agreements that we see delays on interrogation of officers and the provision of a statement. You know, typically you would imagine if you had someone who was shot and killed, you know who shot and killed the person, you would want a statement pretty much immediately or at least within 24 hours. We see delays of up to 30 days uh, on that initial statement, right? And so that, that can have a big impact. It can have a big impact, especially given that there can be a requirement that the officer who engaged in the potentially unjustified shooting gets access to all of the evidence before they provide that statement. Right, so they can design the statement in a way that is consistent with, with the evidence. <clears throat> Imagine that we have a good faith employer who wants to deal with this well. Right, there are restrictions on on the amount of time that the investigation can have to occur. Uh, and then even if, like, imagine that they are, they know that the, the person is a bad apple, but they're unable to terminate them. These collective agreements frequently essentially have the elimination of all of these records within a year or two. So it's, it can actually be really difficult to even flag this for down the line. Uh, and then last, <coughs> so we, you know, let's imagine that there are restrictions internally in the department in terms of what they can do for oversight. In Canada, we have somewhat effective civilian oversight of policing, certainly more effective than south of the border. Uh, but these contracts can actually block the ability of civilian oversight to be applied in a, in a department, right? So it's really covering all the bases uh, with respect to the ability to limit prosecution of these officers. <coughs> Uh, what do these unions do outside of, the, of outside of the kind of the criminal justice process for these officers? <clears throat> I mean, they are regular unions. So we know that police unions boost pay, uh, they boost productivity. And I, I plan on studying this in future work, but we also know that there is, uh, police unions really respond uh, to bargaining and arbitration. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Uh, we see wild swings in productivity, not just during a bargaining dispute, uh, but if, if a police union doesn't get, you know, if they go to arbitration and they get something that they're unsatisfied with, Alexander Mass has been able to pick up that we see huge declines in officer productivity until the next bargaining cycle. So there really is a, there's a remarkable ability in these unions to respond on mass uh, in a coordinated way uh, to outcomes that they don't like at the bargaining table, which is you know, nowadays is probably relatively unique. <clears throat> so going into the empirical work, important to be clear on what we think the channels might be. <coughs> uh, I'll start with the second channel. I think that this is not the channel, but it's, it is totally viable. Uh, so we could imagine a universe in which, right, the union comes in, back in especially for the public sector, easy case for a 15% union wage premium there. So if you make a mistake as an officer and you're tossed out of the job, right, that's something you don't like is maybe you don't get a job that pays as well. Uh, that's a viable path. Alternatively, right, maybe those with higher wages are leading to better quality officers. Who are less likely to use force. So there is a plausible path for which the union, right, leads to lower levels of use of lethal force. The flip channel is one I've been focusing on uh, so far, right? Bargaining power leads to pieces of the collective agreement or other cultural changes that limit disciplinary action, meaning that your marginal decision to shoot increases, and so we end up with a world in which we have more civilian deaths. So it could go either way, but my prior going into this project was that that accountability channel was, was really going to be dominant. Uh, I the other one was viable, but I would have been surprised to see it. <coughs> With respect to disparities, right, going in, given that marginal decision to shoot model I, I walked through, we should expect to see more, if we believe the accountability channel, more non-white and white civilians being killed. But certainly given the context with which these unions are rolled out, and given the existing levels of discrimination and policing in this period, Right? Our prior should be that we're going to see racial disparities uh, in the use of force <coughs> and that as killings go up, at least at a proportional level, it should disproportionately represent non-white civilians in the United States. And we're, we're certainly going to find that as, as well in our results, unfortunately. So uh, you know, I've got about just under 20 minutes left. <coughs> so let's get into the research design uh, and into the results. <coughs> so tackling this type of project uh, I, th I think one of the reasons uh, that we have less work on the use of lethal force and not just collective bargaining than we would like is that the data has been uh, less than ideal for a long time. 
uh, especially pre pre kind of 2010, uh, you have to rely on, on the vital statistics data and deaths by legal intervention in it, which it are those data are plagued with problems. Uh, but the approach of my co-authors and I is that, <coughs> I mean, we shouldn't back away from an important question just because the data aren't perfect. Uh, so we're going to bring to the table four different data sets. I'll talk through each of them quickly. We're going to use kind of the classic state level public sector bargaining data set from Freeman and Vleta. We're going to use the vital statistics for deaths by legal intervention. We'll use crime controls uh, from the FBI's uniform crime reporting data set. And then we'll pull out a bunch of historical controls uh, for counties uh, from the county and city data book, which is this kind of compilation uh, of covariates from this period. So on the collective bargaining data, I mean, again, a good audience to, to know about these things. What, what's important for us in this data set <coughs> is that this is all for public sector workers and it splits out types of workers. So core public sector, firefighters, police. And then it has a, a wild amount of detail on what uh, the legislation enacting collective bargaining does. And so we're gonna focus in very narrowly on, <coughs> right, is bargaining, is bargaining allowed? Uh, is it required and so forth. In the original version of this paper, uh, we, I guess, took the, the least favorable approach to ourselves where we looked at simply uh, collective bargaining is legal, right? It, the, it, bargaining is authorized. <coughs> uh, you know, after presenting it a couple of times and coming out of, out of the sector myself and having organized in the United States, right? Uh, there aren't many unions that are, are trying to form in places that don't have the duty to bargain. Right, especially in the U.S., the cost of engaging in, in ULPs is, is near zero for an employer. So unless you know, unless the union or unless the employer truly has an obligation to sit at the table, you are not forming a union uh, nowadays in the United States. So we were urged by a couple of folks to focus in on states where there was either an implicit or an explicit duty to bargain, and we do that, and that's driving our entire treatment effect. So we're, we're happy we made that change. I could show you some uh, some robustness checks around authorization to bargain. That's not going to do anything. So we focus in on the duty to bargain. <coughs> and we've got nice variation. So this is the US at the end of our sample period uh, where right, you've, got, you've got states in different regions of the country that have a duty to bargain for, for law enforcement officers. And this actually isn't the picture that I would have guessed going into the project, right? I didn't expect to see parts of the Midwest not have the full duty to bargain. And we have great timing variation. And this is what we're gonna rely on for, for identification. <coughs> Right, we see, sure, it's kind of liberal states that move at the very beginning, but then we see reasonable variation politically and with respect to demographics over time as to when the duty to bargain is implemented in these different states. So that's very helpful for the plausibility of our results. <clears throat> so that's the first set of data. Second set of data, uh, so police related fatalities. So this is something that we have to pull out of uh, the CDC's data on, on vital statistics. Uh, what is what's bizarre <coughs> is that we can get these data by race, but race is white, non-white, over this period at the county level, right? So this is very micro data, and that's publicly reported up until 1988. Uh, the data disappears in a later period in which we would need to go into a research data center in the United States, and that's not something that, that we're able to do, unfortunately. Uh, but thankfully, right, for most of the period where these data are censored to the public, we now have better data sets that are created by the public, like fatal encounters, mapping police violence, uh, and so forth. If we want to look at these data over time, <coughs> right, just your kind of your simple picture, right, we see deaths by police uh, surge uh, in the 1960s and kind of peak around 1970. And that's in the same period where we see bargaining rights being rolled out. That is not a causal story, but I know some people like that as just kind of a gut check as, is, is this plausibly what's going on? <clears throat> so I mentioned downsides to these data. Yeah, there are a bunch, but primarily, right, the biggest issue uh, is that they're a dramatic undercount. And we know they're an undercount uh, and it's been well documented. <clears throat> but what is helpful is that we know, if we look at, for example, these data in the present and we, we track them over time, we know that they're strongly correlated with these better publicly uh, publicly sourced data sets. So while the undercount is present, they mirror the trends that we're seeing in society. And so you could actually go about, and I mean, when we started this project, we realized that you could do a correction. <coughs> and what was lovely is that by the time, you know, we were, we were getting closer to publication, uh, some folks in a, in a huge mega team project published in The Lancet uh, have provided us with that correction. 
and that correction will make our treatment effects look even larger uh, than what we've actually found. So, you know, there could be tensions here. What would be the biggest challenge to identification? It would be if we imagined that reporting shifts at the, and when, for example, the civil service, including police and maybe morticians, uh, is professionalized. And so we're gonna have a series of falsification checks to see if we see any evidence of, of kind of shifting practices in the reporting for other types of deaths in these data set, in this data set, and we're gonna see nothing. <clears throat> uh, crime data, kind of uh, usual deal. There are some reporting issues with American crime data in this period, and so we'll engage in a series of robustness checks around the degree of reporting that's not gonna have any big impact on our results. <clears throat> and so to get a sense of what we're working with, right? we've got population, we uh, and we have it by race, we have income and income by race. Uh, we have a reasonable description of what poverty looks like in these communities. Uh, and, and we have a good sense as to what crime and police presence looks like. <clears throat> and so here we have the treatment group as right, counties uh, where collective bargaining rights for officers are present, control group where they're not present. Uh, and right, even though treatment, so treatment here is gonna be at the state level. So we're gonna have to cluster all our results by the same, or cluster all of our standard errors, uh, just so folks know that on the back end. Now, ideally, right, we would want our treatment and our control group to look the same across all these areas. <coughs> That's not gonna be the case, right? Uh, you don't always get to pick these things. Our treatment group is gonna be bigger, poorer, less diverse, have less crime. But what's most important for identification is that the picture around civilians being killed by law enforcement is gonna look very similar across these communities uh, before treatment. <clears throat> so that's gonna help our story a lot. Additionally, we'll, we'll run all of our results comparing counties on either sides of borders where these groups are gonna look more similar and our results are gonna hold up there as well. <clears throat> so our empirical strategy is, is uh, called an event study. It's a sort of uh, difference in difference in which we allow the treatment effect. So that's the treatment effect of collective bargaining rights <coughs> to vary over time. And we're basically getting identification by comparing places that get treated at a point at a point in time to places that will get treated but haven't yet been treated, and then also factoring in places that are never treated at all. <clears throat> and so you could imagine, yeah, that, that approach might have a, a bunch of tensions. So you could, for example, suppose uh, maybe the timing at which a place is treated with collective bargaining rights is related to non-white civilian deaths, uh, ex ante. And we're not gonna find that. And so that's very helpful from a, a causation perspective. <clears throat> you could also imagine that there might be differential trends leading into treatment. And again, we test for that and we find no evidence of it. So this is a reasonable empirical strategy and certainly it's the best empirical strategy we can use with the data limitations we face to get causation here. <clears throat> that's the math for it. What, what you should know to be, to be comfortable is that Right, we're, we're going to use a whole range of fixed effects that are going to kind of pull out a lot of trends or, or unobservable pieces from the data. So we can have individual county fixed effects. We have uh, like year by state fixed effects. We can even pull out kind of, we, we can have individual uh, kind of uh, size of municipality by year fixed effects. So we're going to pull as much as we can out of this that we think might, might be going on that is not related to what we're actually studying. <coughs> Happy to answer questions on that later if folks are interested. So into the results for the last 10 minutes. Uh, what do we find? So I said that this event study is looking at treatment effects over time. So what this picture shows is uh, on the left, we've got treatment effects of collective bargaining rights in the years before collective bar bargaining rights turn on. That shouldn't do anything, right? If that's different, statistically significantly different than zero, we've got a problem. On the right, right, we've got treatment effects over time. <coughs> and so what do we find? <clears throat> For non-white civilian deaths, thankfully, we see this basically flat pretreatment. That's an important test for the, for the validity of our empirical approach. If we look two years after treatment, again, we're not seeing much. And my co-authors who, who don't come from labor initially were panicking. And I said, this is, this is great. I mean, if, if collective bargaining rights come in, if we saw a treatment effect in a year, something else is going on, right? Uh, the time to... Have the, have the national or the state fed recognize it. Folks want a union, get organizers in, hold the drive, you know, get your bargaining team together, negotiate the first collective agreement, get it up and running. That's not happening in a year, right? That's a long pro. Well, maybe if you're really lucky, it's happening in a year, <coughs> but that's probably taking two or three years. 
to occur. And when we see these treatment effects start to bind, it's kind of th three years and after. And these effects, these effects are large. Uh, we're talking about roughly by, by the medium to the long run, about 0.036 non-white civilians killed each year in each county that is treated in the United States. And the United States has um, you know, over 3,000 counties. <clears throat> and this is importantly, right, on top of the fact that this is a major undercount in the data. If we're looking for percentage increase, this is about a 70 to, on the upper bound, about a 90% increase on the number of civilians being killed. Uh, so a very large shock. If we look at the white population, <coughs> this is flat, right? So this is, this is just no impact of collective bargaining rights on white civilian deaths. Now, a, an important gut check for us was, you know, what, what do we really know about unions that we would expect to see in these data if they're real? And so, you know, there, there are going to be exceptions to this, but on average, <coughs> right, we know that unions are gonna drive up wages the union can set, can set W, the employer can set L. Uh, and so on, right on average, we'd expect to see a decline in employment associated with that. Uh, and we see that clearly in the data uh, using our, our county level data. <coughs> the reason that we're guarded in this effect is that if we use a, a, a more complete set of data, but for a much smaller subsample of cities, we don't see anything. Uh, so the county level results give us some comfort, but we don't want to rest on this as, as a core finding. And additionally, we don't view it as as, as, as interesting, right? This is kind of a, a classical finding. Now, with respect to crime, right? If, if we saw this big productivity story, we could imagine that there could be substantive decreases in crime. Uh, and we're not going to see any evidence of that. If officer employment is declining though, right? If that's real, crime staying roughly constant would be consistent with a modest increase in police productivity. Uh, so that, that wouldn't be a bad story for, for the union if it's occurring. <clears throat> Violent crime, similar story. Now, the other big result that we care about <coughs> is in this margin to shoot story, right? Yeah, more civilians are going to die, less officers should die, right? Because some of the times where they choose to shoot, maybe they should have shot. Uh, officers are not going to be any safer uh, after collective bargaining rights come out. And, that, and that's frankly troubling. Right, because you would think that the union would be prioritizing the public safety of, of these officers. Uh, and so if anything, right, we potentially see modest evidence of an increase in officers being killed in the line of duty. And I think that's consistent with right increased officer use of force, also leading to some of these not, not very good trends around uh, right relations uh, and use of force uh, also against police. Right? And on net, we see a more violent situation appear. <clears throat> So we go through and we do a, a whole bundle of robustness checks. So we throw out places we don't have data of, over the entire period. We use different fixed effects. We interact all of our population and poverty controls with a linear time frame. That changes nothing. We drop some states. We look at only states that move early and we look at only states that move late. Our results are the same across the board. And that gives us a lot of comfort. <coughs> uh, if economists in the room wanna see some of our uh, fancy difference in difference estimators, happy to provide that. Uh, I mentioned that there is this new correction to the data. So we engage in that correction and we see that our treatment effect uh, is almost, I don't know, about 80% larger at some of the at some some of the later points in time. Uh, so that, that's not surprising in what we expected to see. <coughs> if we don't believe our base empirical strategy and we want to say, you know, Rob, are, you, are these places really the same? What we do is we go and we throw out all counties, right, that are kind of in the middle of a state, and we only look at counties that border states that have a different bargaining regime over time. Uh, and so we can do that. <coughs> we can toss in, we basically control for, for fix for pairs of the border, and we can run our regressions. Uh, we can't quite do the event study. We don't have enough power in this case. But in our, in our difference in difference here, we see the same results both for non-white deaths, and we see the same results for sworn officers. So limiting our sample in, our, in that way, again, makes us more comfortable. <coughs> Other kind of robustness pieces that we've checked, uh, you know, you could imagine this is just the 1960s uprisings. I mean, we already have a paper on it. We went and we checked it. That doesn't shift these results. You could say, well, public sector bargaining rights are, you know, they're coming in in places with stronger labor movements. So this is, you know, for, somehow this is related to, to private sector union membership. We segment our sample and we don't see any difference there. Uh, we go and we test whether or not the authorization to bargain matters. No, right? It's, I, it, the duty to bargain drives the entire effect. Uh, we go in and we test, you know, is this actually 
talking about unions or something else. And if we look at counties that have a union, at least one union in 1987, big effect. In fact, bigger than we saw elsewhere. If we look at counties that have no union, no effect, although there's this creeping possibility of a threat effect at the end of the period, right? And that, that wouldn't be surprising in that we would expect to see right, departmental practice tend to collapse in on the union model over time. <clears throat> so in terms of another mechanism, right, you could imagine that these law enforcement officer bills of rights might matter. <clears throat> so these are pieces of state legislation that pull the most kind of rigorous parts related to prosecution out of collective agreements and put, put them into state law, and they supersede uh, employment law. And so these could really matter. So we've got when they roll out, we've got their timing, <clears throat> We see that they're unrelated to the implementation of the duty to bargain, which is fascinating as these were a top bargaining priority in, in the political sphere for police unions. We look at their impact on the use of force and we see nothing. And we can control for them in our baseline regressions. And again, it doesn't shift our results. So these law enforcement officer bills of rights, which have been a focus of activists, really don't appear to be the channel. Uh, and part of our goal here is to help inform activists with the evidence that they want around, right, what should they be looking for to secure at the table. Uh, you know, just a couple of other gut checks. So I mentioned this data challenge, uh, right? Or is it just that professionalization is leading to different data practices? We go and we look at whether or not these morgues are reporting out different numbers of civilian or uh, of su suicide data, and we're not seeing any change there. So that gives us some comfort. Now, now last, <coughs> But I mentioned this, this uh, explanation for white, non-white uh, differences in what's happening on the death front. If we control for arrest patterns, so this is over-controlling. Uh, it's another endogenous variable. It's not an appropriate control. But if we go and we do it as a gut check as to what's going on, right? we still see this non-white death effect and it's large. But what happens is it's certainly messier, but it now appears that there is a, an, an effect on white civilians being killed over time. Uh, and this right, aligns pretty strongly with this well-written about historical literature on quota-based policing in this period. <clears throat> so kind of, this is what economists do nowadays. We take the kitchen sink, we throw it at it and show that we can't, we can't wipe out this result. So this is a rigorous result. <clears throat> now, someone who's been active in the policy sphere, right, when, when wrapping up this paper, I, I wanna be clear around what I think these results mean. So one, right, it, collective bargaining rights are, are clearly driving this really substantial increase in killings of non-white civilians. Uh, you know, the pathway, if we, it appears to be accountability, I think that, well, I know that our next project in the space is going to be looking at individual procedural protections and agreements and figuring out which ones are doing the action. Uh, but recognizing this differential engagement piece, driving the, the, uh, the race-related race -related results is, is quite essential. Right for appropriate interpretation, uh, you know. I, I think it's also a good reminder that levels of engagement with community, when those engage levels of engagement are not requested by the community, right, can be really damaging uh, in a world in which uh, we do see some bad behavior. Now, if you want to go <coughs> and you want to correct this, right? So, like. Jamie and I have been invited by both Democrats and Republicans uh, to present this work in front of different audiences. Uh, and they obviously like these findings for really different reasons. <laughs> I think that a, a, a lazy way to interpret our results and to walk away with them would be, yeah, we just strip collective, we, we strip officers of collective bargaining rights, right? They're, they're not real trade unionists and this is doing harm. So they're, they're out. <laughs> uh, I think collective bargaining rights are rights. I think that even if there are long-standing tensions between workers and police, and especially the current incarnation uh, of, of police unions, uh, right, those rights are irrespective of how we, we feel about individuals or cultures. Uh, and so I think those need to stick around. <coughs> so how else do you deal with this? I think the optimal path, right, and I think the reason we've ended up in the situation is actually bargaining priorities of the employer, right? So what happens at the table you know, the union sits down, and at the beginning, these unions look more like other unions, even in, even in the current incarnation. And they say, we want wages, we want benefits, we want pensions, and we want procedural protections. If you're the local government who has, is on a tour of four-year election cycle in the U.S., you say, okay, well, if I do the former, I'm going to have to raise taxes. I can give you the latter, and that has no cost to me, or at least no cost that is apparent. Uh, you know, we, what we know now is, yeah, there is this huge cost, 
right? There's this huge cost with respect to civilian deaths in particular from the non-white population. Uh, and so the employers being cost minimizing employers has likely jeopardized public safety. So those employers, I, I would argue, have an obligation to go to the table and say, yeah, we made a mistake and we need to bargain away some of these pieces that are, is, uh, that are undermining public safety. Uh, <laughs> that might come with a cost at the table, uh, but I think it's important that we recognize it and understand that those trade-offs can matter. And it's not the case that in the United States, offices are all paid you know, six figures like the vast majority of Canadian police, right? There are departments in the United States where officers are making $38,000 a year working full-time, right? So there is dramatic variation. Uh, and I think that in some departments, right, there's probably a reasonable case to boost compensation, particularly if that can be given in exchange for making policing more safe for people of color. <clears throat> now, that's a decentralized approach. The alternative, and I, I should be pragmatic around the likelihood of, of governments uh, getting there, the alternative approach is to say, look, bargaining rights are bargaining rights, uh, but we can shift what is a, a permissive subject to bargaining. And you can do wages and you can do benefits and you can do workplace health and safety, <coughs> but you can't bargain over things related to the criminal justice system, right? In terms of how it applies to members, that is off the table. I think that would be a very reasonable path. And, and then last, right, I, I think that we're getting to a consensus in, in folks who study uh, policing from the quant side that, you know, I, I think we everyone would have hoped that the bad apple number would be like 2% that I usually hear the 20% number thrown out nowadays. But there's there are lots of right officers who, who genuinely care about public safety. Uh, and well, you know, I think we all know that lots of unions don't necessarily maybe have their democracies functioning as well as we like, right? These are supposed to be democratic institutions. Uh, right, the NLRB has protections in place that help try and ensure that. <clears throat> and so officers, right, who care about non-discrimination, who care about public safety, right, they can have a fight in their own local. And they can have their locals opt to prioritize that at the bargaining table as well. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that we need to recognize that we can put the onus on the employer, but we can also put it on the union uh, to get to better outcomes. Uh, so I think that is an appropriate, uh, an appropriate place to wrap it. And I'm happy to take questions and to have a discussion. So thank you all for the opportunity to speak. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Rob, for a very rich presentation. Uh, I'm sure lots of folks will have lots of different things to ask. So if I could, if, if people want to ask a question themselves uh, directly to Rob, please raise your hand using the raise hand function and I'll, we'll be able to make you visible and you can ask directly. If you would prefer me to ask your question, put it in the chat, in the Q&A part of the, of the Zoom, uh, and, and I can do that. So we do, have, uh, we do have David Sykes who would like to ask the question, so I'll, we'll start with them. David. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the interesting presentation, Rob. My question is, have you done any analysis in terms of uh, compensation under police collective agreements and this enhancement of so-called public safety. In Canada here, we've had a few, in Toronto, in fact, my sister-in-law is a TPS sergeant, and there's been a couple of incidents. One, one notably happened a couple summers ago where a young man was shot and killed by a police officer, and he was actually convicted. And I'm sure you're familiar with that case. I'm just wondering if there's any sort of analysis or in your research that links compensation with um, overall safety directly. Please, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. What we've been using, we use overall payroll as a control here. Uh, I, I think that we could, it, it would be viable to do that. And I, I actually think, I, off the top of my head, right, I would need to get a source of exogenous variation for compensation. Uh, I don't know something off the top of my head that does that in the United States, but I'm sure something exists. And I think that is a really I think that is a very important question. I think it's a nice way to draw out the implications of this work. Uh, so it's something I should follow up with. It is one, oddly, that I could probably do in Canada. <clears throat> so in you know parallel work, we finally got some information on deaths by legal intervention in Canada, just 2000 to 2020, but it's still something. Uh, and I have an ongoing project with a former student that um, should be in the working paper stage soon, where we actually can get causation around kind of funding for police departments. Uh, in particular, I think for folks who know, who know about policing, we have, uh, there are sharp funding discontinuities based off of population size and communities, where the cost sharing arrangement with the federal government shifts dramatically if you gain like one extra person, 
if you're at a, at a boundary. So we could compare, it wouldn't necessarily just be compensation directly, but we could compare right, these big shifts in budgets for departments uh, on, on outcomes. Uh, the other way that it could maybe be addressed, and I'd be curious if, if we would something that would be interesting is the one department where we have amazing data as a result of a, of a lawsuit is we have amazing data on Chicago, like everything about Chicago, uh, and we could probably get individual officer compensation and try something there. So that may not be generalizable, but that the, the information would be present. So yeah, da data is always a, is a challenge there. Okay, great. Um, so Torin Meg in the Q&A asks whether you've considered making a pamphlet for city councils describing this issue and possible solutions, because of course, that's where a lot of the uh, dynamics of, of this issue to, you know, play out. Yeah, I, you know, I haven't been asked to make a pamphlet. I would be happy to do that. That would, that would be really interesting to do. I, I would say that most of our civic engagement has actually been at the state level. I would say that state legislators, state legislators in the United States, you know, on, on average democratic, but but of both parties, are interested in, I think, leapfrogging uh, the municipalities and jumping straight uh, to a labor legislation solution. Uh, yeah, but a pamphlet would be good. Uh, and I think that, I mean, it is particularly salient in the United States. Uh, I would like to be able to do this work in Canada. Uh, recent shifts around the RCMP, right, and, and their collective bargaining status, probably will enable us to do a similar uh, project. I'm, I'm hesitant I'm, he I'm hesitant to necessarily apply these results to Canada. I mean, uh, certainly after I, I, I put this work out in the public sphere, I, I had at least a half dozen heads of Canadian police unions attack me fairly publicly. Uh, you know, so is the life of an academic working in a, in a tough space. Uh, yeah, it could go either way in the Canadian context in that Canadian police unions, they're their kind of their cultural history and their history of organizing actually isn't that different than American police unions. Uh, so from that perspective, my instinct is, yeah, this result might be similar. And civilian death levels are actually quite high in Canada. It's just something we've never really grappled with, but we're, we're an outlier compared to everyone other than the United States. Uh, on the flip side, right, we do have much tighter constraints on what can be in a collective agreement related to the judicial system. So that pathway isn't necessarily accessible in the same way. So I, you know, at a personal level, I, I'm more able to put this out into the Canadian sphere, but at the same time, until I know for sure how this binds in Canada, right, I, I want to be a little bit hesitant. Certainly the advice I would give to, to any police board or any municipality here would be, right, be, be extremely careful around procedural protections. Because, uh, right, you, sure, you're, you might be saving a bit of money, but you are likely uh, having a large impact on public safety if you offer those. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the floor is open for more questions, whether in the Q&A uh, box or just by simply raising your hand and we'll, we'll put you face-to-face, uh, -face, I guess, with uh, Dr. Gillizo. Um, okay, in the Q&A, Jackie Smith asks, uh, just a follow-up to Torin's suggestion, we could use a pamphlet for community advocacy groups, perhaps more than city councils, which in many cases in the U.S. have limited jurisdictions over police unions and negotiations. So maybe a, a way to, to, to think about that is like, what engagement have you had with um, uh, community level uh, advocates for either defunding the police or I improving forms of accountability for police in the U.S. as a result of this research. Yeah, actually, and a really good amount. And I, I will say, so I've, I've we've worked what's with the a number. And what's with the response been, I guess, too? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I, I mean, it, it's been really amazing. I, I would say that the capacity for uh, activists and activist organizations in the United States to incorporate and to be interested in, in kind of quantitative causal evidence-based research is, is just amazing. <laughs> and so as soon as this was out in the ether, uh, you know, we had folks like Campaign Zero and, you know, a, a lot of people who were leaders in BLM reach out very early uh, to, to chat about the paper, to understand implications. Uh, and those have become permanent ongoing relationships. Uh, and are mature and productive relationships, I think, for, for both parties uh, in that, right, as a researcher, yeah, I, I, I want things that I can publish, but primarily, right, I want things that are going to help the public. Uh, and folks who are on the ground doing the work know what they need, and they know what they need answers to. Uh, and so I would say that this paper was informed by this general notion of, of what people cared about, most of my follow-up papers to this paper are explicitly grounded in questions that come out of the movement 
where people want to know what fight do we need to win? <clears throat> and so, for example, the, the companion dash follow up paper to this on law enforcement officer bills of rights, which I kind of previewed within this paper. That was an explicit ask out of a number of these activist groups where they were prioritizing labors over police unions in that they viewed it as a more achievable win, but then finding out that these are not driving the treatment effect, right, has caused them to kind of step back and say, well, like it may, it, this might be a general equilibrium thing and that labors might matter if we didn't have these procedural protections and collective agreements, but it's clearly the case that getting rid of them is not going to be the silver bullet to fixing this situation. Uh, so, I, I mean, for any, any scholar doing, doing work in this space, if you're not engaging with organizations, grassroots organizations, right, you're, you're doing it wrong. Uh, you're going to undermine your research, uh, and you're you're leaving the benefits of your research for the public on the table. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Judy Fudge asks a question uh, in the chat. Um, uh, she says, uh, in Canada, typically it's arbitrators who decide these issues. Would you suggest limitations in arbitral powers regarding interest disputes? Is that a, a, a solution and what that what, what that look like, whether in Canada or the US? Yeah, yeah, I would say that's consistent with the path. Uh, we still need to, to track these things out in Canada, but I, I, I would say that the reason we don't have these answers in Canada is that there has been a purposeful decision to deny researchers access to data, right? That, that, hasn't, that hasn't happened by accident. Uh, and I think for a long time, the own it, we've treated the onus here as being on marginalized communities and researchers and people uh, who, who have been discriminated against to prove that it's happening uh, before we can do anything and we can think about the response. I think we're practically at a stage where we need to flip that, right? If our state institutions are not going to make the data accessible to test this, you know, we should do our best to recognize where there are institutional differences across the border. Uh, but then, right, we should act on it under the assumption that the same problems are here. Uh, and if those, you know, if organizations then want, if they don't want us to do that, they should put the data on the table so <laughs> right. we can test it. Uh, right. So I, I would say, yeah, in this case, I, that would, I think that's a reasonable takeaway, right? My, my scholar instinct is, oh, you know, I don't want to jump there because I, I haven't tested it in Canada, but I don't know if I can. Uh, and I, I think the implications of this research are, are clear. So I think in particular, if, we, if we're going to be, per, if, we're, if we want to be cautious around civilian safety, which I think is a reasonable approach for government, yeah, I, I would probably think about that with respect to arbitration. Okay. Um, Hassanein Khan asks a question in the Q&A. Um, uh, I wonder what the relationship with uh, police union leaders and police executives or chiefs is like and what role that may play, I guess. I often think of that relationship differing from what we usually expect to see from employer-employee relationships, but does that have any effect on how strong police unions are and the culture of allowing police to evade being held accountable for actions? Great question. Oh, that, that is a great question. <laughs> uh, so that is an area where we don't have much research. Um, we're thinking of starting a new project on police chiefs. I would say there is dramatic variation in that relationship. <laughs> so I'm going to guess that the question is brown in, in a sense that, you know, maybe chiefs are a little bit more buddy-buddy with rank uh -huh. and file and with the union. Uh, that's going to be the case sometimes. But I would actually say on average, chiefs have been much more not only open to but supportive of broad reform efforts uh, than rank and file unions in policing. Uh, I think that's really that's that's frankly really unusual. I, I mean the, the incentive is perhaps that a lot of the solutions right do rest with stronger management rights. Uh, but we have seen we've seen a sharp tension in in kind of with the rise of BLM within policing between chiefs and unions and, and tip and with chiefs on average being a little bit more open to reform. Uh, I think that you, the problem is gonna be a lot deeper in when we don't see that tension, right? When, when we have this scenario where, where the chief and the union are extremely close and, and there's, there are good reasons for that, right? For, for the chief, the union not only is this kind of internal alternative power structure and kind of political risk in their, in their unit, but especially American police unions have strong enough comms presences that they can potentially outperform the department in public communications. Uh, and so if they're on the, you know, if they're quotation marks on the same team, there are large returns to the chief. <laughs> so in terms of, you know, how, how do we think about that relationship and how do we think about solutions? I, I do think that we are, we, especially now we're, we're seeing, you know, when, when I would do round tables on this, it's unusual to not have a chief on a round table and a chief who was calling for reform. Uh, 
Uh, and so I, I think that having some empowerment of them is, is probably helpful, but also, right, we, to some extent, you don't even necessarily need empowerment of the chiefs in that they already have probationary periods, right? So what I would say to, to a chief who, who maybe wants to prove their goodwill here would be, and, and I, I think maybe this is, speaks to, the, to their being nervous about the relationship with the union, is American policing has wild amounts of data. And there are now these economists uh, not, who, do, who do more technical work than me, where you can have a really good sense from those data as to at the time the probation ends that an officer will engage in uh, a kind of inappropriate behavior over their career, right? You can basically map out a pretty good guess. And so if chiefs are serious, right, use those data uh, and, and start using probation like it's intended for. And that would be relatively extreme, but those are, you know, those are powers that they have under, under these collective agreements. Uh, but yeah, I, that's a great question. And I, and I honestly wish we knew a little bit more. And I'm hoping that probably three or four years from now, I, I could give a more substantive answer. Great. Other questions that people want to ask, whether by raising your hand and, and talking to Rob directly or putting in the q and I, uh, I have a question um, which relates to um, whether or not this analysis might be applicable to other similar types of unions that are, you know, we might say are part of like the coercive state apparatus. And I'm thinking here in particular of prison guards, um, which, you know, are very much in the context, uh, you know, part of the labor movement in uh, and, and accepted as such uh, part of major public sector unions. But we might also find some similar dynamics around their role at, because, of course, part of their job involves the use of violence. Um, and that violence is, uh, I think we could probably say, probably racialized. Um, so, I mean, I realize that you've not done the research here, but, you know, what application might this analysis have to other groups of workers? And, um, you know, should it, should it be done? Do you have anything to note about other research in, that's allied to, to your research with other groups of, of workers? Um, and then I, after that, I might have a second question. If no one else jumps in, which I very strongly encourage people to do. Yeah, uh, also a great question. I, yeah, correction, for correctional officers, you know, one, the history differs a fair bit on organizing. Uh, and so I'm not as nervous there for, for that reason. But I will say uh, what we're seeing in a, so I, I gave a talk uh, at, a, at a house committee in Pennsylvania uh, where they were holding off on, on giving law enforcement officers uh, a law enforcement officer bill of rights, but they had just granted one to correctional officers. Hmm. <laughs> and so I would say, uh, my, certainly the treatment effect might be smaller, but if I were to think about, like my, my guess is that with these law enforcement officer bills of rights, if we didn't have police unions or if they didn't have the same protections, the effect would be large and it would be similar to what I just presented. Uh, and so for correctional officers where we don't have the same extent in their collective agreements of these protections, we'll have some, introducing these same procedural protections will have bad, bad implications for the safety uh, of inmates. I mean, I, I, I don't, the effect might be smaller, but the, the direction of the effect has got to be the same. Uh, and so I, I, would, I would basically show uh, severe caution. Uh, and if I were to think about this in the Canadian context, gosh, have I not looked at this compensation data in a long time? But are, tell Stephanie, you know, are correctional officers still a fair bit below police in terms of compensation? I don't know the answer to that, but I would imagine. Yeah, historically they have been. Uh, and in that case, right, I, I would actually be even more worried about this finding in, in the Canadian context. So I would say let's be precautionary in how we think about this for other employment groups and act proactively with respect to correctional officers. Uh, and then, you know, certainly other people have made, and if we don't think about other folks in the coercive state, you know, folks have tried to make, I, I was in a teacher's union for a long time, I'm in the professor's union now, so you can imagine that people try to make a linkage there. My, my takeaway on, on folks trying to make that argument is <coughs> there is a vast difference uh, between people dying and other outcomes, right? And I, I do not think that that's a reasonable comparison. So just to cut that one off proactively in case anyone wanted to go there. Right, gotcha. Uh, any other questions for Rob? 
know any economisty questions. I do see there's some of the few economists in the in the crowd still left. Um, maybe you want to convene and talk about the math later. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, all right. Uh, well, um, with that, then, if, if there's no further questions, let me uh, thank you uh, very sincerely for presenting your research to us. So much to think about. Really interesting. And thanks, everyone, for your participation today. Um, interesting questions. Um, and uh, have a great rest of the day. Um, and join us next uh, year, next fall, for our speaker series when it starts up again. All right. Take care. Thank you.